Thanks so much, Michael, and thank you everyone for your patience. My sincere apologies for being late. Um, my father, when um, we were children, uh, always used to say to us, um, uh, in, uh, in a Maltese accent, of course, better late than never, right? When, <laughs> meaning, you know, don't, um, especially don't speed and stuff like that. My wife constantly says to me, you didn't have to take him so bloody literally that you're always <laughs> late for everything. <laughs> She's quite right, but... Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting and uh, to pay my deepest respects to their spirit of collective dreaming, collective resistance and collective hope in the face of ongoing colonisation and dispossession. Uh, hope is a, a precious thing, you know. Uh, some people say it's cheap. I think quite the opposite. Uh, and in many ways... Uh, people sometimes say to me, oh, don't you ever feel like giving up hope? You, um, you know, w what have you achieved? And, well, I, I, I certainly don't feel uh, that we've achieved uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the completion of social justice in Australia. Although I was on a, uh, on, a, on a consultative committee once in New South Wales when Maurice Yemmer was Premier. It was the Premier's Social Justice Task Force and we met a few times and then received a letter in the mail saying that social justice had been achieved and therefore the task force was to be disbanded. <laughs> I thought that was brilliant, you know, but um, anyway. Um, uh, people often say, you know, don't, don't you feel disheartened? And yes, uh, we all feel disheartened when we see increasing episodes, examples of profound injustice, uh, humiliation of the people, uh, shaming of the people, uh, the, the downtrodden, the demonised, the dispossessed, the crushed, the cursed, the exploited, the excluded. In other words, the biblical people of God. Uh, make no mistake, when, uh, when the scriptures, the Hebrew and the Greek scriptures speak of the people of God, uh, contrary to that uh, sad historical domestication, you know, we've turned a wild tiger into a very tame pussycat and we, we've turned that term, the people of God, into something that is simply a, a, religious, um, uh, a religious reference or an ethnic reference or a cultural reference. Um, it was something far more powerful. It was a reference to those, uh, to the crushed, to the, to the rejects to the disposable people. And the reason I don't believe we have a right to give up hope is because those people, the people that we have the privilege to stand in solidarity with, to provide whatever assistance we can in the St Vincent de Paul Society, uh, but more importantly to receive from them the sacred gift of their stories, the sacrament of their hope. If they have that hope, what right have we got to in, engage in the, in the luxury, in the, in the self-indulgence of not having hope? Uh, when you think of the people who, you know, the, the prime example, of course, is the people who, who set out on the wild seas in a leaky boat, uh, fleeing terrible persecution and suffering in their countries of origin. Not, not wanting to come to Australia because it's, the, it's uh, the, the Garden of Eden, but having to leave their gardens of Eden, which have been terribly spoilt by war and trauma, uh, forced to flee. Uh, so don't, you know, never believe the, the nonsense that suggests that they're, they're, you know, they're coming here in their droves because we've got it so good. Uh, quite the opposite. They're, they're leaving because they've got it so bad. Uh, now, those people have nothing in their pockets except that tiniest, tiniest nugget of hope. Some, a, a, a tiny amount of hope, so, so small that it could easily be mistaken for despair. But there's a profound difference. Despair is where you say there is no alternative. Hope is when you say, I don't know what the alternative is perhaps, but I'm going to fight for it. And that's what those people do when they risk everything and jump on those leaky boats. And then we shamefully incarcerate them and torture them and condemn them to a limbo of offshore detention and punishment, children included. But it's not just them. Uh, you know, we're, we're in the midst of plenty. 
Uh, we are a nation that sadly, even though we, we like to think that blood has never been spilt on the wattle, we're in fact a nation that has been founded on acts of violence and violation and continues to be predicated on acts of violence towards people who are crushed and cursed and then to blame them for that violence. I entitled the um, presentation today, uh, The Stone That the Builders Rejected Has Become the Cornerstone. It's that beautiful line from Psalm 118 uh, that of course reappears in, in the New Testament. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. I find this an inspiring um, metaphor because it goes to the very heart of what it is that we're fighting for. And we're fighting for a new society and the cornerstone of that new society is not the grand ideas or the power of those who currently uh, wield control over society through money and through vested interest. The cornerstone of a new society is precisely the stone that the builders have rejected. In other words, the people that we, we reject as being of no worth, of no value. Um, I, uh, I don't know whether I've, uh, I've shared this story with uh, this group. I've, I've shared it so often in many places. Um, but um, to me, it was such a... I, I'm a very slow learner. Uh, I, uh, I take years for the penny to drop. I'm, uh, I'm the person with the least amount of common sense in any room. And I, I really, really take a long time to work out the meaning of things. And, um, but once I do, I have to keep repeating it so I don't forget. Um, many years ago, uh, when uh, our children were very, very young, um, and uh, my wife and I, we were living in the Blue Mountains west of Sydney at the time. And uh, we had a, this incredible run of, of bad luck, so it would seem, uh, beginning with little things like the white goods all breaking down at the same time or one after the other consecutively. Uh, and then uh, bigger things like our daughter being bullied uh, at school uh, and then me being retrenched from uh, my job. And then a really big thing, my wife um, being diagnosed with cancer. And we thought, you know, wow, this is, uh, this is quite a remarkable um, uh, turn of events, you know, what's going on? And a very dear Aboriginal friend of ours said, oh, have you thought of having your place, um, ha ha having a smoking ceremony done? Now, in my utter naivety and ignorance, I didn't even realise what the connection could possibly be, uh, but she very kindly put us in touch with a, a wonderful elder named Uncle Max, who uh, came and very generously uh, did a smoking ceremony um, outside the house. It was an old, a very old um, house built in 1913. And he, he smoked right around the house. The kids followed him uh, with, uh, with uh, um, uh, branches from a, a gum tree sort of sweeping in front of him. Uh, that's what uh, he asked them to do. And then he did a smoking inside the house and then he did a special smoking, personal smoking, just for, uh, for Jackie, my wife, and she described it as an incredible, uh, incredibly he healing experience. But as, um, as he was doing this, he showed me a place outside in the yard. Uh, it was sort of on a, on a small ridge uh, in the yard. We had quite a, a big um, uh, yard, it was one and a quarter acres. And there was this little ridge and uh, he said, see this spot here, John, um, this is a special meeting place uh, for the old people. The old people have been meeting here for thousands and thousands of years and communicating with the group on the next ridge over there yonder. And uh, I said, what do you mean, Uncle Max? What do you mean old people? I don't see any old people around here. He goes, well, there's the old people. They're still here. And uh, it shouldn't take uh, a lot of imagination for a Catholic to understand. Uh, is, you know, it's, it's basically the, the, the very beautiful concept of the communion of saints, that uh, people are not lost, uh, not forgotten, but still very much with us and uh, looking after us. And uh, he said, so, he said, just so happens, John, your house is built smack bang in that song line, that energy line between this 
special place and the one over there on the ridge and it's interrupted this and this is all doing my head in I don't understand any of this you know I'm a, I'm a very western rationalistic person in many ways but he said to, um, he said but don't worry I'll talk to the old people and tell them that you don't mean any harm and that you um, wish to look after this place and I said Uncle Max does that mean I can't come here and I said just you know this is the spot where the kids like to play they called it their base you know it's a funny thing the kids chose that exact spot as their sort of little cubby house spot where they put branches over and, and built it like a little gunya. And uh, he said, no, no, that's fine. He said, but whenever they go there, they should speak to the old people and say that they're coming and, and say, I come with the greatest respect. And the kids learnt to do that and it was a beautiful thing, you know, afterwards uh, for the entire time we lived in that house, you know. Uh, Jackie and I would be in the, you know, in the kitchen or something and we'd hear the kids out the window running around like maniacs and then all of a sudden we'd hear them going, we come with the greatest respect, we come with the greatest respect, <laughs> as, they, as they, we knew where they were. And um, so he took, took me inside and then he pointed to uh, the lounge suite and uh, a spot on the lounge and he said to Jackie, he said, that's where you sit usually, isn't it? And she said, yes. And he said, that's because um, uh, without realising it, as the mother, you have uh, yeah, unconsciously gravitated to that spot to absorb um, all of that bad energy to protect your family. And I was just still doing my head, still does my head in just the very thought of all of this. And, um, and uh, anyway, he, uh, he left me with a stone. He said, John, I'm going now, um, but I want you to, to look after this for a while and it was a very simple white stone, smooth on the sides and a sharp edge. I don't know what kind of stone it was. Uh, and he said, um, I want you to hang on to this stone, keep it with you for a few weeks, hold it close to you, put it under your pillow at night, and then I want you to bury it in that spot that I showed you outside, that special meeting place, and leave it buried there for a couple more weeks and then pop it in the post to me. And I said, Uncle Max, if it's that special, surely I shouldn't pop it in the post. Maybe I should, I'll bring it round to you. He said, no, don't worry, John. I'll never lose that stone. That stone will always come back to me no matter what. And I'm thinking, well, wow, that's a bit weird. So I did as he instructed, kept it with me, then buried it. When I buried it, I had to go up these uh, steps, uh, the, the place, uh, because it was established in 1913, the, uh, the, the people who, who built it, um, they terraced all the gardens, very European style, you know, imp imposing a little bit of Europe on the Australian bush, you know, hilarious, but it was quite, quite elegantly done. So there, there were these terraced steps and a little kitchen garden outside the kitchen window with a bird, concrete bird bath and all the rest of it. So I went up the steps, buried the stone, um, my dogs followed me and then I came back down the steps and noticed the bird bath that I'd passed was uh, rent in half as if someone had a stone cutting machine, not just tipping off the basin, that was tipped off too, but the column was actually cut in half neatly. And I thought, this is very strange, and I immediately thought of the stone. So I ran back up the stairs and checked my burial of the stone, and of course I had buried it uh, in too shallow a manner, and the dog had dug it up, thinking it was a bone and that this was a game. So I reburied it more deeply, and I'm scratching my head thinking there must be an explanation, there must be a rational, logical explanation for this. So I said to Jackie, um, did you just go out and cut that bird bath in half <laughs> with a power tool that you secretly bought from Bunnings? And she said, no, John. And she, I said, did the kids go and do it as a trick on me? And she said, no, John. I said, could you just check online whether there's been an earthquake in the Blue Mountains? <laughs> she said, no, John. And um, you know, I still don't understand what had happened, but anyway, when I eventually did dig it up and send it back to Uncle Max uh, in the post, uh, because I'm of little faith, I rang him a few days later to make sure he got it, even though he swore that he would, it would always go back to him. And uh, I said, uh, I just ring to see if you got the stone, Uncle Max. He goes, yeah, yeah, no worries, John, got the stone, no problem. And I said, uh, oh, look, while well, I got you on the phone, funny thing happened, uh, let me, and I'm a bit embarrassed sort of telling him. And he just listens and he goes, yeah, that would happen. It's a pretty powerful stone, that. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, my God. Now, many years later, uh, as I said, I'm a slow learner, I realised just how, um, how powerful a metaphor that is and how it um, coincides so beautifully and profoundly with 
um, that uh, piece of scripture, uh, the, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Uh, because in many ways, the stone is like the people. The stone is the crushed and the cursed. It's what gets walked all over, trampled upon, disregarded, discarded, destroyed, shattered. And yet, paradoxically, uh, in the heart of this incredible oppression lies incredible strength, beauty, power, healing. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And that stone was precisely the vehicle for that. It was a metaphor, a symbol of all of that in a, in a very beautiful sacramental way. And I just thought, and you know what, Uncle Max is right, you know. If you are faithful to the people, the people will never leave you. You can never lose the people. Just as he knew he could never lose that stone, the stone would always remain with him and, and come back to him. But we in our turn have to be faithful to the people. We have to remember whose side we're on if we want to be uh, agents, if you like, in creating that societal change where things are completely turned upside down in the, in the radical image of, uh, of the Beatitudes that do call for that kind of revolutionary turning everything upside down as far as the values of our world. Arundhati Roy, the Indian writer and activist, says there's no such thing as the voiceless, only the deliberately silenced and the preferably unheard. I'd like to put it to you that that being deliberately silenced and preferably unheard is in itself a form of violence. And here we are in our uh, wonderful democracy, uh, a few days out from a federal election, and yet, st and, and I treasure that. I think we are very, very blessed to have uh, the democracy that we do have when so many countries don't have what we have. We're also blessed by the great um, uh, wealth that we have uh, in our country and the great uh, progressive traditions. But you know, uh, the, the, the people who are silenced remain silenced. The people who are uh, disregarded, who are preferably unheard, remain unheard. Um, the, the wealth is not trickling down. As Pope Francis puts it so eloquently often and gets into trouble for it just as often, um, you know, this notion that the wealth is trickling down uh, is one of the greatest con jobs in modern human history. And you know and I know that we don't hear the sound of the wealth trickling down. We hear the sound of the excluded still waiting. We hear the sound of people who do have stories to tell, do have incredible power, the power of hope, and yet we, we silence them. We do not listen to them. We do not treasure or revere uh, or, or treat with that sacred respect, um, that reverence, their being, their stories, their mission, that we have the privilege of joining in to create a new society. So the people who put the boot into the, to, to our people, uh, we say very clearly, uh, you know, do not expect us to be silent because an injury to one is an injury to all. We are all injured when people are um, shamed and humiliated the way they are and that those who perpetrate these injuries might succeed in breaking our hearts every day but they will not break our spirits. Paulo Freire, the great Brazilian um, educational theorist who championed and, and um, uh, initiated one of the great adult literacy campaigns in Brazil um, in the 60s and 70s famously said, washing your hands of the struggle between the powerful and the powerless is to side with the powerful, not to be neutral. There is no such thing as neutrality. And now I'm gonna to put to you a thought experiment that some of you may find very uncomfortable, um, but I think it's, I've found it useful to, uh, to do it myself. Um, when we speak of salvation in the scriptures, we often very much personalize that and make it sound as if it is something that happens to us uh, after we die. Uh, that we, we enjoy eternal salvation once we die uh, through union with our God. Uh, 
I'm not in any way saying that is untrue. But again, we water it down significantly when we limit it to that. And that paradigm uh, is deeply violent and violating towards the people who suffer in this world because it's exactly the ideology that has been used to justify their oppression. Be patient. And when you die, your reward will be there for you in heaven. Don't stand up. Don't talk out. Put up with what is your lot because it is divine will. Uh, it's the very message in a way that is given not just through religious structures but through um, societal structures to the woman who's experiencing uh, domestic violence, physical, sexual, emotional, uh, uh, fiscal uh, violence every day. And the message she, she receives not only from the violator but uh, from, from some sections of society traditionally is this is your lot. Even you deserve this and there is no alternative. You deserve this, you're lucky to have what you have or you know, he's got his good sides too. He brings you flowers. Uh, I'm not making things up, you know, these stories are, are ever so true and uh, I've had the great privilege of listening to the stories of women who uh, have very courageously taken that step with that tiny nugget of hope and fled and packed their children in a car and slept in that car parked by a public toilet uh, because there was nowhere else to go. Shame on our country if we can't ensure that a woman fleeing domestic violence hasn't got a place to call home when we're so rich. I mean, what is that, honestly? And that's why we need total change uh, in our values and in our practices and in our allocation of wealth and resources. Um, but that's the message that's constantly pumped into people's minds that you deserve this experience of oppression. Uh, what is said to the woman fleeing in the experience of domestic violence is in a, in a way a metaphor for all forms of violence and systematic abuse and humiliation. Uh, it's a systematic shaming being told, for, and it happens from the first peoples, the first nations of our beautiful country to the most recent arrivals and everyone in between. Uh, you know, we've just heard announced yesterday as part of the election campaign that the $2 billion worth of savings is going to be found by, by taking away from those bludgers who are, who are rorting the system. You know, whilst we know, of course, that uh, you know, billions are foregone in revenue uh, from the big end of town that uh, aren't paying their fair share. Um, but, you know, that's, that's par for the course. That's what we have sadly come to expect. So that notion of salvation is something that happens only at the end when you die, uh, in some ways justifies that systematic violence. And that's why um, the biblical notion of salvation is far bigger and broader and far more human and far more horizontal. There's this trajectory throughout the scriptures of horizontalising the sacred, uh, whereas, uh, you know, instead of thinking of the sacred as above or in the temple or in the church or in the rituals, the prophetic stream is constantly saying, take your rituals out of my sight. I want you to see, I want to see justice being done between each other. I want to see fairness, let justice flow like a river. I want to see a new society where people treat each other uh, with dignity and respect and share rather than hoard and, uh, and uh, act out of greed. Um, and so that notion of salvation is really health, wholeness, well-being for all. And it's a profoundly collective notion. Also could be translated as liberation. It also could be translated as liberation from that slavery of being oppressed. And this is my thought experiment. Um, I'd like to put to you, uh, if, if you found out today um, that there was nothing after death, that there was no heaven or hell, uh, no God, no divine being, uh, would you, would we still engage in this struggle for social justice, this, this sacred struggle for a better society? And it's a tough call, you know, because a lot of us have been brought up to say, well, we do these things, even in the St Vincent de Paul Society, you know, some, some, I've heard some people articulate it that, you know, we are doing this in order for our own personal salvation. And, you know, that's, uh, that's a legitimate 
uh, articulation of faith and spirituality, but it's, it falls so short of the reality that uh, salvation is never just personal. It has to be that collective liberation, that sharing of, of, uh, of what it is to be human. Um, I would like to conclude, because I, I just looked at the time, um, by simply saying this, two, two things. First of all, that, um, that revolutionary change that I have spoken about, that turning things upside down, is not something that simply happens out there. It's a deeply spiritual change in ourselves. Uh, Audre Lorde, the, uh, the uh, Afro-Caribbean um, poet, has put it very beautifully. She says, the true focus of revolutionary change is never merely the oppressive situations we need to escape, but that piece of the oppressor which is planted deep within each of us. It's a beautiful thing, she said, very pertinent to that experience of domestic violence, that piece of the oppressor, even after you've left the situation of domestic violence, that piece of the oppressor remains planted deep within the victim, telling her that she is worthless, telling her not to hope, telling her that she deserves to be crushed. And it's the same with the kind of society we have, uh, even if we're not the ones who are acting in an oppressive way personally, that piece of the oppressor lies deep within us because we're part of this society and that's a really deep and difficult personal struggle that we need to engage in. And I'll leave you with these words that, um, that we will only we will only achieve liberation for ourselves if we are fighters for the liberation of others. We will never achieve our own liberation while others remain in chains. Their struggle is our struggle. Thank you.